right there. We are blessed. Thank you, Ken Harvey. Woo! Good stuff. We have deemed January 2015 as Giving from Grace Month here at Joy. And each week, we have asked you a question, and your answers form the basis of the rainbow of hope via post-it notes on the side wall here. You will notice the first week, the question that you were asked was, what does Joy MCC mean to you? And your answers form the red arc of our rainbow. The overwhelming theme within those notes was hope. Last week you asked what difference Jesus has made in your life and those answers are the orange arc of our rainbow. The common thread weave through these notes is that Jesus Christ has brought you unconditional love and overwhelming peace. What a beautiful sight to behold. We are literally building a rainbow with our answers. So today, in honor of the celebration of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, whose infamous speech, I Have a Dream, is perhaps the most well-known in our time, the question for this week is, what is your dream for Joy MCC? That's the question you will answer on the blue, sticky, I think it's blue, (laughs) bluish, greenishy thing, blue something. If you'll answer that question throughout the day, um, and we will continue to build our rainbow here on the... um, On the wall, I want to thank those of you who helped me this week to get that up there. I look forward. I've already filled out my what is my dream. I filled out first service right when I started saying I was filling my answers out. And I look forward with great anticipation to what you have to say and what your answers are to your dream for Joy MCC. Pray with me. God, we thank you that you have done it before and you're going to do it again. And so do it again today, God. Open up our hearts to receive your word of hope. Thank you, God, for the dreams that others have had, but most specifically, God, for the dream Jesus had to release captives and recover sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. And may we continue to be instruments of that change and peace and hope in the world. And may we continue to dream of a place where all people are included and everybody's welcomed and nobody is separated from the love of God we find in Jesus Christ. We thank you for this opportunity. And we ask you to open our hearts to receive everything that you would have for us this this day. We trust you, God, and we thank you for doing it again. Amen. Do you recognize this? Welcome to Hollywood. What's your dream? Everybody comes here. This is Hollywood land of dreams. Some dreams come true, some don't, but keep on dreaming. This is Hollywood. Always time to dream, so keep on dreaming. Everybody's got a dream. What's your dream? These are the first and last lines of one of the most popular movies of our time and one of my personal favorites. If it's on, I will watch it. It's one of those you click through and, you know, normally you don't stop, but I'll stop on that particular one and watch Pretty Woman over and over again. It came out in the late, in, the, um, in 1990, and it is the story of dreams. Dreams of going from the lowly streets of Hollywood to the lofty heights of the penthouse that tops one of the most expensive and luxurious hotels around Orange County, California, not to be confused with Orange County around here. It is the dream we all have had of meeting our prince or princess charming and living happily ever after with them. Along with our soccer mom suburbans or our lightning fast Lamborghinis in our mansion in the midst of Beverly Hills or Islesworth, take your pick. We all have a dream, don't we? So what's your dream? How fitting it is that our dream Sunday falls on the week that we celebrate the birthday of the great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, whose speech that he delivered in the midst of the nation's capital on the Lincoln Memorial on August the 23rd, 1963, entitled, I Have a Dream, causes us to remember with great pride such an incredible man of God. I believe he was a prophet of God, much like I believe Troy Perry is a prophet of God, to bring about change that needed to happen in the world. And through both of them, we have been recipients of their dream, and I'm grateful for them today. There is, with with no doubt, his speech made a tremendous impact on society, and in this particular hope-filled, inspiring speech, 
we find that hope that he was dreaming of. I listen to it over and over, particularly this time of year. I listen to it over and over during the week to prepare for the sermon, and it still gets me every single time, particularly the part where he said that he still had a dream that was deeply rooted in the American dream. He said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all humans are created equal. I have a dream, he said, that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the son, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream, he said, that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream, he said today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream, he said today. That dream which was born amidst great oppression and injustice still inspires me to want to accomplish great things for the world and in particular true equality for all God's children even in the midst of great trial and tribulation in which we often find ourselves in the midst of the great celebration. Just on the 6th of this month we now hear the Supreme Court will hear this thing again and we may go right back downhill, but I trust in a God who believes that justice will come for all people one day, and I'm not going to stop fighting until it happens. This is our dream. I just have to briefly say, when they were talking about the fines being dropped, at the same time those fines were dropped, a neighbor complained about the area, which is why we had to go through this handy par handicap parking thing, and it ended up costing us thousands of dollars to prepare the handicap parking, and it was going to cost us $7,800 in fines, and luckily the city heard us. But do you know now they're talking about the RV that's parked in our lot, that we actually get money for, for the guy that lives across the street that pays us for that, and it really helps us around here. And now they're complaining about that. And you know what I'm going to do when that RV is moved? I'm going to put a sign over there, keep trying, Jesus keeps winning. This is my dream, bring it on, because God wins around here. That dream, which was born out of great oppression, still inspires me to want to accomplish those things, like continuing to, to show that God's will is done around here. I chose our scripture lesson for today from the book of Jeremiah because much like the world in which Dr. King found himself, the Israelites found themselves in a place of great trial and tribulation. You remember the history of Israel. Back in 722 B.C., the northern part of Israel had been taken captive by the the Assyrians, and then in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar and the people of Babylon came into Jerusalem and swooped down on them and took captive all the Jews that were living there. And this pagan army plundered the holy city and laid it in waste. They took the Jews with them back to Babylon to then be their slaves and to have the, Babylon, have the uh, Hebrews live in exile. During this exile, the Jews kept praying that God would deliver them and restore them to their homeland. Perhaps they prayed a similar prayer that Dr. King prayed in the midst of similar oppression. In the midst of that exile in a strange land under oppression, God spoke these wonderful words of hope to God's people. And I believe this passage of Scripture is God's dream for all of God's people. For them back then and including us today now, God says, For I know, even when you don't know, the plans I have for you, God's plans for our welfare and not our harm, plans to keep up with you, not to abandon you. So God's plans are often very, very, very different from our realities. God's plans, He said, I know the plans I have to give you the future you hope for. 
In other words, the future you've always dreamed of having, right? Our scripture lesson tells us three things, I believe, while we dream. I do not disappoint. (laughs) The first one is God will do just as God said God would do. We can take God at God's word. If God said it, we can count on it happening. Go back with me. Remember, you go back all the way to the Exodus. In the book of Exodus, remember, in the end of Genesis, Joseph brings his family down to Egypt because there was a famine in Israel, and they all went down there. And then over time, they stayed, and and the population of Hebrews grew and grew. So by the time... 400 years later, when, the, when um, we hear from the book of Exodus and Moses is born, Pharaoh has capt- ha- captured those people and made them slaves because he was concerned that they were going to overtake his country, right? And so what do you do when you're afraid of people? You enslave them. Chew on that for just a second. He did the same thing to them, and so what happens He begins to tell the nation, any baby boy under the age of two, kill him. Remember? And then all of a sudden, Moses' mother has Moses, and she doesn't want to kill her child, and so she ships him off and sends him down the river. And Pharaoh's daughter gets him and raises him in, in Pharaoh's palace. And this Hebrew child is grown up in the Egyptian kingdom. And then as he grew up, Moses realized he was different. Any of y'all been there? You realize after a while you're a little different than everybody else around you. You don't rank quite the same. And Moses felt that way. And somebody was picking on one of his own that he knew was one of his own. And he kills him. And then he has to run away. And you know, you think it's over then. And you think you've done something wrong and God's never going to use me. And what happens? God comes knocking at your door. God comes to Moses and says, you already know what's the inside of all that, so I'm going to use you in the places from whence you've come. And I'm going to use you to help your people. And so he gives Moses the task of going to Pharaoh to let God's people go. And after Moses gave all those excuses that we talk about often because I use the same ones, Moses went ahead. And then when he goes to help his people come out of bondage in Egypt, then all of a sudden... Plagues start happening. And I told him earlier, you know, I don't like bugs. I do not like um, darkness. And I don't like blood. And all those things happen in those ten plagues. Starting with blood covering the land, that's too much. That is too much. And then some frogs. I do not do reptiles and things. I, and bugs and stuff. And then locusts and all this. I don't, I don't do those things. I would have died on the first or second one. And then all the other stuff happened. And then darkness comes over the land. Joseph, I got lamps all over me. I got lamps everywhere in my house. Have you been my? I got about 1,400 lamps in a, in a small space because I can't stand to be in the dark. So y'all know, I, I'd have been dead. It was just horrible. And these plagues happened to these people, but they kept going, right? And then after all that, they endured all that stuff. And then they get, they're running away from those people, and they get to the Red Sea. Now, how are you going to get across that? And the people, sadly, are right behind them, coming right behind them. The the Egyptians are coming right behind them. And then what happens? God parts the sea. God will do anything to help us out, right? And he did it, so he parts the Red Sea, and those Israelites go through on dry land only for that river to cave back in, and the Egyptians no longer can pursue God's people. And God brought them to a land. And what does this tell us? God's going to always do just as God said. God remembered in, in Exodus 14, Moses first says, and God remembered the covenant God had made with God's people back from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God's going to always do what God says God's going to do. And I'm grateful that the promises God made for me, God has brought to pass. Just like Ken sang about, God will do it every single time. That's the first thing from this scripture I can remember. God will do just as God said. And when I can't count on anybody else in life, I can count on God being true to God's word. You can't count on folks. You can't count on society. You can't count on the government. But you can count on God. Jesus always wins. That's the first thing. The second thing I believe this scripture tells us is that God has a plan for your life. 
And I'm grateful God has a plan for mine because my plans messed me up. Okay, if I got my way, Lord knows where I would be. But I'm grateful God has a plan and God keeps steering me. I keep trying to go this way and God takes me back this way. And I'm grateful God has a plan for my life. And you know, sometimes it don't make any sense, does it? I look around like, how is he going to do something with this? What is going to happen? How are we going to get through it, right? And I realized, I realized while I was working on this that it is often like I'm looking at a big mess. It's like a, a jigsaw puzzle. Where's that bag of puzzles, y'all? Oh, it's right there, D. It's like I'm looking at a bunch of pieces of puzzle and they don't make much sense all by themselves. But then I realized that when I've got this little piece, and I don't know how it connects, but somehow it connects to the rest of these in this bag, and ultimately it makes a picture. I realize that I've got some pieces to my life in my hands, but God's got the big picture. And God's seeing all of that. It's like when you're in an airplane. And you know, I'm amazed. I always like to sit on the window seat because I like to lean my head against something and I like to look out. And I realize that I might be on that road right there and in the plane because I have a larger, higher perspective, I can see that it goes all the way down there and then I can take a right or left and then it's going to take me all the way over there. And I can't see that from where I am. But from a higher perspective like God's, God can see the big picture. And sometimes my life is just a bunch of this. And God says, you can put that together. And I'll help you put it together. And it's going to be a real pretty picture one day. And then I remember the story. I actually told this earlier. Actually, probably during Advent, I told the story of a little girl is struggling. And she's in high school when her boyfriend broke up with her. And she's failing algebra. And all those things that happened when we're in high school and all that. And probably quit, you know, didn't make the track team and that kind of thing. And she's complaining to her mom, who her mom's in the kitchen making something. And as her mom is making those things, she offers her some eggs, and they're like, no. And then she offers her some flour, and she offers her some, some um, oil. And the girl's like, yuck, that's all horrible stuff. And the mom says, but when you put all that together, it makes a real pretty cake, a real delicious cake. And sometimes I sit there looking at the eggs and the oil and the flour of my life and go, how in the world is God going to do something with this? And God puts all that together, and then it makes sense to me. And I realize God sees a much bigger picture than I can ever possibly see. And I have to trust God with the pieces that God gave me. That somehow they all go together. And that God's going to make that pretty picture that God has for my life. And my life's picture is no prettier than your life. And God's going to do those things and put them together. But I have to trust God that you're the next piece of my puzzle. And somehow you work into my life. And somehow you're part of His life because you're part of that puzzle. And I trust God in this. God knows the plans God has for me and sees a much larger picture than I could ever possibly see for myself. God knows the plans. And then thirdly, I believe this scripture tells us that because God knows the plans and because God has dreams for me that I didn't even dream for myself, that if I just simply keep believing in what He said, that He will bring it to pass. And you know, it's hard because I get stuck on the pieces and forget about the picture. And then I remember sometimes if I just keep believing in what I know is true, keep believing that the Lord will see me through. There's a song that the Gaither vocal band sang by those titles. Let me read. It's really good, and I don't, and I don't know all of them by heart. But let me read some of that to you. It says, when troubles rise and catch you unaware, the day-to-day -day of living seems unfair, and you try again at your dreams and plans that have ended in defeat, and the fancy thrills that once fulfilled now leave you incomplete, and you wonder where your life's gone wrong and why you can't find peace. Well, your hope's not gone. It's just been too long since you had to believe. And then the chorus says, keep believing in what you know is true. Keep believing you know the Lord will see you through. When troubles rise in your life and you don't know what to do, you'll be fine if you just keep believing. 
You can take him at his word. He is faithful, kind, and true. Not a prayer will go unanswered. In his time, he will see you through. Keep believing in what you know is true. Keep believing you know the Lord will see you through. When troubles rise in your life and you don't know what to do, keep believing. My God is faithful and his word is true. What he's promised, I know he'll do. You'll be fine if you just keep believing. And I want that to be the theme of my life, that when I don't know what's going on and I can't make anything of the mess of my puzzle pieces of my life, that God's going to continue to help me. I had a man in Charleston when I pastored there, and he was a kind soul, and he was one of the most genuine people and had more faith than anybody that I've ever met in my life. And he had every struggle you can imagine. He was HIV positive, and 10 years before I met him, he had had brain lesions from that, from all that had been going on in his body that left him in a paralyzed state. His right arm didn't work well. He drug his left leg. His speech was, you could not understand most of what he said. But he believed and had more faith than anybody. He was struggling. He had some health issues and he wasn't feeling good for several weeks. And he finally went to the doctor. And then I kept asking him, how's it going? How's it going? What's going on? And he finally emailed me one day and said, Pastor, the doctor says that the tumor is cancerous. And I've got an appointment with the surgeon next week to have my spleen removed and it's just an outpatient basis, and I'm not worried about it because I know God's got this. And you know what he said? So don't you worry about it either. And guess who was worried? He was not worried at all, and I was, I was beside myself. And you know, the whole time, he lived about nine months with that. They ended up doing that. They opened him up, and cancer was all over his body. And they simply closed him up. But he kept believing and he came to me the next day after that email he sent. He'd come into the office and we were talking. And then finally I looked at him and I said, Hass, are you okay with all this? And he said, Pastor, I got two choices. I'm going to live or I'm going to die. And then it hit me. And I said, yeah, Hass, you know, either way you're going to be all right, right? And he said, yeah. And you know, he lived those nine months with more faith and more courage and more strength than anybody. But he taught me how to live in the midst of his dying. You know why? Because he believed God had a plan for his life. And he knew that no matter what, God would see him through. And sometimes it takes those people that are down and out to teach me about true faith. That when I can't see it sometimes, God sees the bigger thing. And God's dreams for me are way bigger than my dreams for myself. So saints, let's keep dreaming. I've got so many dreams for Joy MCC. And it looks a lot like what I'm looking at right now. There's not a place in the world where you can go. And there's this much diversity in the room at one time at church. Did you grow up with all this diversity in your church? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. I didn't. There's colors in here. Like a rainbow. And identifications that we didn't even know existed, like a rainbow that we're building. That kind of works. Thanks, Kat. <laughs> nice. And God's dreams are even bigger than that for us. So let's keep dreaming. Because God will do everything God promised. God will bring it to pass. And I simply have to trust He knows when I don't. And He knows better anyway. And He's going to see that big old picture that God is painting of our lives. And so may we continue to trust God in all of this. And may we keep believing, knowing that God will always do what He said. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the dream that Martin Luther King was dreaming. This is the dream of Jesus. May it come to pass in our lives. May we always believe. May the church now say amen. Amen. amen.